Hello everyone. After a break, we're going to do uh, kind of a little recap of uh, where we're at um, with the overall big picture solutions, hyper solutions, strategies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So at the highest level, we're starting with a conversation, which we call the conversation. The conversation, which is sorely missing among our species today, is the conversation, how do we save life on Earth? Starting right now exactly where we're at, not how might we in the future. No, this isn't a speculation about that. This is roll up our sleeves and make it happen right here, right now, with the understanding and the belief that what we do here now has ripple effects and that there is some community out there that is going to come up with, for lack of a better word, the solution, right? The biggest number one, number two, number three solutions. It may be three different organizations. It may be one. Um, and we are trying, we believe that we uh, have some very special uh, things to add to that process and even some big solutions that we've been contributing to and working on. So the conversation, how do we save life on earth, can have lots of different answers. The answers that we're looking for in particular are answers that we put in the category of hyper solution. What is a hyper solution? A hyper solution is the entire set of solutions that the world will need, some in parallel, some in sequence, uh, to, to save life on Earth. And it is that set of solutions, as well as an implementation strategy, complemented by an implementation plan that goes step by step, right? And so we are in search of for lack of a better word, the holy grail of the best possible hyper solution, which we can then set about implementing, right? And the implementation will need to be exponential because we have very little time left given that the planet is exponentially overheating, right? And exponential has three portions. There's the flat line portion where it looks like there's no growth at all. There's the knee of the exponential, which is pretty round. And then there's the vertical portion. We are in the knee and we're about to go vertical in terms of planetary overheating, um, which is essentially a death sentence if we couldn't stop it. The good news is we can stop it. And the way that we stop the, the exponential planetary overheating is through application of planetary scale solar radiation management. We're talking about a good number of millions of square kilometers of reflective material added to different portions of land, ice, and ocean uh, in different parts of the world to reflect a portion of the sunlight back into space. What we're essentially talking about is a dimmer switch on the sun to cool the planet, to forcibly cool the planet by ejecting or rejecting a portion of the sunlight that would otherwise heat up the planet. <clears throat> and in order to get the world oriented and on track to get that all rolled out, right? Whether the conversations are around the engineering to get that done, whether the conversations are around financing to get that done, whether the conversations are around getting governments on board and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we believe that to make SRM, solar radiation management, happen, we will need a level of planetary collective intelligence of which this is an example. But now imagine instead of this one conversation, a network of millions of conversations happening in parallel, each being transcribed in real time, and the text transcriptions being automatically indexed as Google does for free to any text anywhere on the internet, uh, but being indexed in real time because these are very special conversations precisely so that people can search through 
the conversational database using very, very advanced search techniques to find exactly those conversations that they want to plug into right now. Just like you landed here, Sai. Uh, by the way, how did you find out about us? I'm curious. Shankar. Oh, Shankar. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Shankar. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, so just like you found out about this conversation and chose to jump in, um, part of the, the, the vision of collective intelligence is that we make all conversations visible that want to be visible. Obviously, private conversations are totally fine, of course, but those that want to be visible like this one, you know, can be maximally visible and maximally discoverable, maximally joinable, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Um, now, how do we get to a state of collective intelligence, right, of actually collective superintelligence? Because if you take that picture I just painted to, you know, not even an extreme, but just carry it forward in terms of its evolution, in terms of like what I was talking about, discoverability, joinability, et cetera, and lots of other mechanisms for people to be able to say, hey, I have an idea for a solution. I'd like to start a conversation. Does anyone want to join me? I would call that a broadcast, like a tweet kind of thing, right? Um, so there's all kinds of mechanisms basically to facilitate getting the right groups of people together at the right time to work on the right things, right? The right solutions. So SRM is something we need to do ASAP on the order of months. This is the kind of thing that would normally take like, you know, probably a decade for humanity to get its act together around if it were really urgent. <laughs> We need to pull it off in months. So we're not gonna be able to do, I, don't, I really don't see us doing it with the normal dysfunctionality that we're experiencing right now in terms of government and media, social media, market economy, church, you name it. It's just one big dysfunctional cluster mess. And we need to get smart and get together really, really quickly, um, really, really effectively, really, really, really right now. So that's collective intelligence evolving into collective superintelligence, right? Um, how, how do we get there? Well, it just so happens that we now have a growing food crisis in the planet, which was sparked by the pandemic, but also has other roots and could get a heck of a lot worse uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the exponential planetary overheating. It could be that we have massive crop failures as soon as this fall, um, and so, um, we believe the opportunity is now to put together a planetary collective intelligence by bringing together a community of communities. <clears throat> what, so uh, let's, let me call it a group of communities to make it simpler. All right. This group of communities, who would be the member communities? The member communities would be communities who are feeding people, right? So whether it's the Hare Krishnas feeding thousands of people in a specific location or, you know, one family feeding, you know, three or four neighbors on their block, large or small, right? These are feeder communities. What we are suggesting is that we create a network of these feeder communities focused on the singular goal of ensuring that everyone has plenty to eat of nutritious foods, not any kind of foods, whole food, plant-based diets that are immune boosting and full spectrum nutrition so that people can be healthy. And also during times of pandemic, we want to include the delivery of food right to your home right to everyone's home, like what China did, right? When they faced the pandemic. Extend that basic model times eight all around the world, right? That's the best way to stop pandemics so that people can stay home. Um, and the, but among the, among the many benefits of this is, can you imagine waking up into a world where everyone has plenty to eat? And that's just guaranteed, right? I mean, like, you could literally try to be a failure in life, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, but there will always be food for you. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, there will always be food, right? 
I mean, try not working. Food is just a human right, All right? Can you imagine waking up in that world where the, the safe, the floor is no longer starvation and humiliation and death and disease, but the floor is now elevated up to everyone's at a minimum here. We used to be down here, <laughs> right? The floor used to be down so far. And my goodness, what a, what a soul crushing, heartbreaking life it has been up until now living in that world where there's no safety net, right? You know, unless you're rich and can buy all kinds of insurance, right? But there was no community safety net. We weren't, we haven't been operating as a community of human beings. So we believe that by solving the, the food crisis right now, immediately, and putting intensive focus on it, in the process, we will build a collective super intelligence because we'll have billions of people participating, right? You're either a feeder or you're being fed by a feeder or you're just living totally alone and just tending to your own garden. Okay, that's fine. But um, everyone either is a feeder or loves a feeder, <laughs> right? So there's gonna be tremendous support for this community of communities, this community of feeder communities, communities that are feeding people and wildlife too, if you want. Great, please join too, right? Um, so we start with the very basics of food right here, right now. And as food networks are collapsing, as whole sectors of the, the economy are crumbling right now, but very notably food networks, um, there is an urgent need to redesign these food networks. And ra rather than redesign them around money or profit or banking or whatever, what if we redesign them around feeding everyone all the food that they need? nutritious, whole food, plant-based diets so that they're well with great immune systems, right? So that is the first imperative. But, and the, the, way, the way that we intend to do it, um, wait a second, we've got someone joining here. Um, who is the person that says D-L-H-E? I don't know, this looks uh, kind of funny. This person who just joined, we, we've had some uh, Zoom bombs in the past. Uh, person who just joined, would you be good enough to identify yourself? <laughs> All right. Close, close your eyes, everyone, just in case. Yeah, no kidding. In fact, I'm gonna pause recording. Uh, no. Okay, so, um, We, um, we believe that, of, look, humanity needs something to focus on right now, right? It needs something to bring us together. We need something to unite us, right? In the past, those have typically been wars, right? One people gets united against another people and then millions of people die and et cetera. We need a different kind of unity right now. We need a planetary scale unity where all of humanity, um, comes together to take on a mission. Well, I say that there are so many, there are so many, there's so many things going on in the world today and so many things going on wrong of so many different types and classes and natures, right? Um, there's a term cluster mess, which has a not so polite derivative, but this is a cluster mess that we're in right now. And, Oh, Benjamin, yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. Benjamin and Suzanne. No, we just, I did not mean to interrupt. We have to get going. It's great to see you. Oh, no, no worries, no worries. Great to see you guys and come back anytime. We'll be going strong for another 12 hours. Woo, 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 woo. Okay, <laughs> see you soon, thanks. <laughs> so out of our entire cluster mess of problems, right, which are we gonna focus on first? Uh, shutting down nuclear power plants, uh, setting up a defense system against asteroids, uh, everyone going vegan. Uh, you know, what do we take on first? The f most basic is feed everybody. It's, it's just the obvious, right? That's the most fundamental basic human need. You know, that and like not freezing, 
you know, so, you know, shelter, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but food is the biggie. Um, and it's, it's, it's simply time to take it on and it will stabilize society, civilization. Right now we're on the brink of chaos. We're on the brink of famines, which means war, civil war, guerrilla war, terrorist attacks, hijacking, stealing of food, everyone being afraid of everyone else, afraid of their neighbors. And we basically, you know, have a pretty rough tumble down into a kind of a Mad Max state. I don't know if that means anything to you, that movie Mad Max. Okay. Anyway, it's just a dystopian future uh, that's been predicted, which we now have the privilege and opportunity to avert with exactly what we're talking about, right? Once everyone is fed and those wheels are turning, no one is going to try to stick a, <laughs> stick a, st a wrench in the gears and try to stop it, right? Jamie, you who have experience with government and politics and all of that, how popular would someone be to try to stop a food system from running and try to turn it into a profit-based thing when people are happily being fed day in, day out? Well, if we could get to that point, um, it would be, um, everybody, I think everybody would get on board if we could get to the point where they could see that it's possible. Uh, a good example of what uh, we're not working together as a global community is what we're seeing with the pandemic right now is, <clears throat> you know, we're whatever, 12 or 15 weeks into a global lockdown and people are literally arming themselves and, and marching on their local capitals with guns and, and freedom flags are trying to force what's best for everybody to stop happening. So there's always going to be an element of the population that is self-serving. Uh, but to suppress that element of the self-serving people that will be the beginning of the uprising and the downfall is to make sure that everyone's made whole all the time. So we have to, we have to incorporate even the worst of humanity into this equation so they feel safe and are arming themselves and hating their neighbors. Because you, here in America, we're seeing that a lot now. These so-called freedom fighters and uh, you know, independents and all these people that are not necessarily anti-government, but um, pro-independent thought, I guess. It's, it's a lot of... Uh, Hey, hey J Jamie, brother, I, I hate to, I hate to, I hate to interrupt Jamie, but you're you're so the signal is so bad on your end that we we can't hear. I'm gonna go ahead and, and mute you, Jamie. There, there's, there's people rising up and uh, a, a microcosm of this. And I, I'm gonna go on mute, but a microcosm of this is what's actually really happening in China actually today uh, in Taiwan. Um, Taiwan is saying we want more autonomy and China is saying that's not an option. So they're coming to loggerheads again, a time before the pandemic and now uh, before we've solved the pandemic, people are fighting over the pandemic. Yeah. 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 You, you, it was kind of hard to hear, very hard to hear you actually. Um, maybe next time you, if you turn off your camera, it might channel it more through the, the audio, but anyway, that, that, that's good. We, we got, we got the um, picture there, Jamie. Yes, James. Ma Ma Melvin's, Melvin's mic is still uh, unmuted. You might be able to mute his, uh, that could have been causing the feedback. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Got it. No, I, I did it. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, Sai, do you, do you mind muting your microphone when you're not, not talking? Oh yeah, sure. I actually forgot that. No problem. Okay, great. Thank you, Sai. All right, great. Um, so with that as, as kind of a, you know, uh, a high level, 
our whole hypothesis is a this is imminently achievable and it will be incredibly popular right humanity is going to get on board so in droves and so what we need to do is simply we're right now we're just finding the pathway to you know to get on board this is the hyper solution that we're focused on other people might come up with totally different hyper solutions right what was one that somebody mentioned uh, hour a couple hours ago oh yeah green new deal that's an another example of a whole different kind of hyper solution right um we believe that ours is um a truly amazing and very totally achievable and absolutely necessary because it incorporates the three crucial elements of feeding everyone collective super intelligence and cooling the planet in time and quite frankly either we get on it and do all of this or we're going to be dead pretty soon that's just the reality that's how fast the planet is overheating. So si, have you ever seen Monty Python? Just give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. You don't need to unmute. Monty Python? No, you haven't. Okay. Anyway, I'll just, it's, there's this cartoon in it. Um, and Myra, I see your hand go up. There's this cartoon in it, okay, where there's all these people like playing music or having a little parade at it. And then this giant like Godzilla foot just comes down and squishes them all. It's this gigantic foot. It crushes like a hundred people at once. It's all a cartoon. It didn't really happen. But anyway, what I'm saying, I'm going to call that the Monty Python foot. The temperature is spiking. It's about to spike so intensively up and could jump 10 degrees centigrade in a matter of years. That would just fry us all, you know, to bits. The only thing that's going to stop that upward rise is a Monty Python foot crushing it down. That's it. And the, there's only one kind of Monty Python foot on Earth that can possibly do that, and that's planetary scale solar radiation management, which could potentially be a multi trillion dollar investment. But how do you get a dysfunctional humanity? Have you, had you even heard of solar radiation management before talking about it with me or with Shankar? Yes, no, yes, okay, you'd heard about it, okay. Well, you're in the very tiny minority. Most people had never even, have never even heard about it. It's something we all need to save our lives and most people haven't heard about it. We need collective super intelligence to make that happen, this decade long project happen in like five months. I mean, it's a crazy, insane thing we need to make happen. And the only way we're gonna do that is if we have this collective super intelligence. And I think the fastest way to get there is through food this everyone come together and we're going to make sure everyone has plenty to eat. We're going to work it out. We're going to figure it all out by sharing all the different local models. Most of food is local, right? And each locality has come up with its own model. So, you know, earlier it was discussed the example of an Island in the South Atlantic where everyone just shared their food. All right. Bring that model to the table and share it. So everyone can see how, how did it work? Tell us. Well, here's this other model where it's all volunteer, but they log their hours and it's time banking and all that, right? Okay, share, share that. So the first step is just all these different feeder communities coming together and sharing what's working, what's not working, helping each other out, giving each other advice, et cetera, et cetera. That becomes the beginning of collective intelligence. And then as we get, as we create better and better tools and better and better rules and culture and practices and all this stuff, it can just, it'll just explode. And we need that to do SRM, to do the impossible decade long project in five months. <laughs> That's it in a nutshell. And Myra has her hand up and I welcome all questions, comments, et cetera. Go for it, Myra. Sorry, Jamin, I've been, I've been listening to the conversation, but I've been doing so many things here going up and down. Um, but anyways, I, if you guys see, I sent a link. It's really interesting. And I actually took the time um, last week to read about the meaning of this. It's almost like the sun is going on a, on a lockdown also. Um, and this is not fake news. It's actually something that the NASA research, that is, it's a cycle that repeats. 
I don't know if you're familiar with this, and I don't know if this situation might help to not go very further into the effects of the, uh, I'm gonna say of the, the glaciers in the post not melting because of this whole situation that in, we might start going into a mini ice age. I don't know if you guys wanna read about it, if you guys heard about it. I mentioned it on the last meeting last Wednesday or Tuesday, the Solution Club meeting. Yeah, I haven't heard anything about it. Um, that would be quite a game changer. Um, but until I, well, I, I would, I would just need to look into it. Um, and um, uh, um, I, yeah, I've, I've heard of it. I went to, you know, Jeremy Corbyn. He's he was he was the leader of the opposition in England until recently. Uh, they've got another leader of the opposition now, and his brother. Piers Corbyn goes around the country uh, lecturing on it. Now, when I first heard it, I thought this is completely wacky. I, that that was the impression I got. I didn't look into it much further. Um, recently, he was arrested. Piers Corbyn, this is Jeremy Corbyn's brother. He was arrested because he was protesting about the lockdown, and. <laughs> on some corner with a bunch of people you know like your lockdown protest we had a little one here um there might be something in it i haven't studied it enough but honestly when i heard his lecture i just thought he was completely whacked out yeah you know i i, I have no idea what to think but here's the, here's the thing this is for me just more evidence that we need to put together a collective intelligence so that collectively we can make sense of all this news right <clears throat> um because here we are trying to um oh and welcome uh Ab Abiyose and um uh, shankar do you want to introduce um uh your friend Oh, Shank Shankar, you're on. You're on mute. Shankar, can you hear me? Shankar, he typed that he has. Um, ah, okay. Audio. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay, very good. Well, welcome, obvious. I, I don't know if I, I please said uh, let us know how to pronounce your name. You actually said it correctly, Abiose. Abiose, Abiose, Abiose. Welcome, Abiose. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. We're deep in a conversation about uh, ending hunger, feeding everyone, um, and going on from there to, well, in the process, actually, forming a planetary uh, collective intelligence that can evolve into a planetary collective super intelligence, which we will need uh to one way or another get a handle on whether it's exponential planetary overheating or cooling because of a solar minimum or whatever i just heard about that and hey you know if that's what it is then we need to figure out how do we brace ourselves for that but whether this roller coaster is going up or going down we need a seat belt <laughs> right if, if we're in a period of exponential overheating, we need solar radiation management at a, at a planetary scale. And we need uh, to get that deployed within months, uh, not years, but months. And, um, but whatever the case, we need a planetary collective intelligence, a really smart uh, collective intelligence, which once we get it started, it will go super intelligent. We've analyzed that thoroughly and that's, um, that's just the bottom line of it. We need a planetary collective superintelligence to make sense of exactly what's going on and exactly what the treatment is so that we can survive. Indeed. Not just hum humanity, but all of complex life. Yes, Abiyose. Yeah, indeed, I was agreeing with you. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, thank you. 
so um yeah so that's it boom it's it's kind of like a three three stage rocket right feed everyone go super intelligent and stabilize the cool the planet and stabilize the the the, the climate right one two three and um we're basically right in the middle of a real life science fiction movie where you know the planet is headed towards destruction unless <clears throat> you know the solution can be implemented in time and you know welcome to mission impossible planet earth <laughs> seriously i mean i don't i don't know of any other simpler way to say it but that's exactly where we're at right now so we are then focused on how do we put this together? How do we feed everyone? And so we're, the, the next logical step that we've identified is to build a network of communities, a community of communities, where each member community is what we call a feeder community. What's a feeder community? It's a community that feeds people. Small, medium, large, extra large, doesn't matter. If it's a community that's feeding people, welcome. Please join us. We need you and you need us. Because if what we're doing is we're creating a network of all the feeder communities all around the world to come together and share. Share expertise, share information, share knowledge about different programs, what's working, what's not working, what's missing, what resources do you need, how can you get them, et cetera, et cetera. What relief programs do we need to set up, right? What community garden development programs do we need to support, right? What volunteer opportunities are there, right? Hey, I live on Whidbey Island, Washington, where can I volunteer, et cetera, et cetera. By putting together this vast planetary network of feeder communities, held together mainly by meetings like this. We meet every Friday, Saturday for 24 hours, from six o'clock in the morning Pacific time to six o'clock in the morning Saturday, 24 hours later. <clears throat> At the, th this is called the Collective Intelligence Block Party. It's a 24 hour meeting. And um, then on Tuesdays, we meet for eight hours from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. every Tuesday Pacific time. You are all welcome to all of those meetings Feel free to come and go as you please. This is your home. Welcome home, my brothers and sisters. Welcome home. This is your home. Make yourselves comfortable. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Right? The rules are simple. <clears throat> just, you know, be nice. You know, don't interrupt. Raise your hand. It's real simple. Really, really simple stuff. And if anybody, you know, breaks a rule or something, I will very gently let you know. So don't, don't worry about it. Don't, don't like, oh. Did I do the right thing? Yeah, just, just, just relax, 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 relax. We have rules, but rules are also made to be broken. Um, the main thing is just be nice, be kind. And you guys are nice. If you're friends of Shankar's, you're automatically nice, kind, and friends of mine. So welcome. Simple as that. <laughs> I'm the first one to break that rule, so. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, only as far as when I say, like, I'm a friend of Shankar. <laughs> very good very good well welcome welcome Sai. welcome up you and uh so we're you know we're basically working out the details of how do we build this you know community of communities of feeder this community of feeder communities and so we're uh working on what we want on the website what the messaging should be and just coming right out and saying it, we have a vision of humanity all united, working together. And we believe that the beginning of that is you, the feeder communities, right? Who are already feeding people. You are the imaginal cells of a world that works. <clears throat> You're the ones who are making it happen on a local scale. We want to empower you. You're not alone. In fact, you are, you, we, every human being on earth who's eating is either a feeder or is being fed by a feeder. So you're always one mouthful away from a feeder if you're not a feeder yourself. 
unless you're hungry, in which case we need to get to you ASAP. We need to know where you are, what you need, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to you. The network will get to you. That's the promise. That's the vision and that's the promise. And that's what we're committing to. So we're articulating that. We're figuring out the best way to articulate it. Good thing we're recording, all right? Because we get, we're basically just rehearsing how to articulate it and, and the best take goes up on the website basically in terms of text, right? Um, so, you know, we imagine a world, we, 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 are, we envision a world of humanity united, together, working together, feeding everyone, absolutely everyone, every single day. And we imagine that growing out of this practice, this process, right, this new global dance that we're all going to be doing called Let's Make Sure We Grow, Prepare, and Deliver Enough Food for Everyone to Eat and Be Healthy, right? As we dance this dance, it will change us. It's changing us already. Just being in this conversation is changing us. It's so exciting. It's like, really? Can we really do that? The answer is yes. So we must. There's simply no other option. Um, so we communicate that, we're communicating that vision through the website and through an invitation. What's the invitation gonna look like? Hello, you know? We, you know, we, we, first of all, thank you for feeding. Thank you for being a feeder community. Thank you for doing your part. It's because of you and others like us all around the world that, that you know, that we're caring for so many people. Now we need to take it all the way. We are building a community of feeder communities. And we'd like, we cordially invite you to join us. Let's all get together so we can all support each other. Share the best practices. How do I make a community garden? You know, but my soil is very rocky. It's like this, it's like this. Okay, okay, well, here are your options, right? Well, what kind of seeds should I plant? Well, here are your options, right? There will be experts right all around the world who you can tap into and so part of our challenge so we're, we're creating this community of communities and we need to find the most efficient ways to enable people to get the support that they need and to participate in the conversations that they need to meet the people that they need to get the advice the support etc right and it could be that you have a bunch of small feeder communities in a particular region and they need to all get together. They need to find each other, right? Have you all heard about like in forests, there's like this thing called a ribosomal network of like fungi, funguses underneath the forest floor and all the trees are connected and they share nutrients and they share information and all that. That's basically what we're talking about. If each feeder community is like a tree, right in the forest we're creating the network to network all these trees together to share food to share knowledge to help out to do volunteer work together hey we need to get this community garden going but you know we need you know 10 strong people with shovels and picks to help you know prepare the soil on this saturday at this time who's in in in, in. okay great now we got plenty thank you well, great we'll see you there right just getting together. The thing is, um, I heard an interesting data point earlier today. Um, Brett Warshawski, who was on this morning, he lives over in England, so he's sleeping now. But he said that I think it was like on a three acre area of land in Chicago, this group grew a million pounds of food. They were showing how much food can be grown if you really max out right like on multi-level vertical farming and all, all that all that cool stuff so it's absolutely amazing how generous uh, mother earth can be if we treat her right and we all need to come together to help our mother now 
and to help each other, help our brothers and sisters and help our mother. We are all one family. Anyone who's ever told us otherwise told us the biggest lie. Oh, because your skin looks like this or looks like that, you need to help, you need to hate those people on the other side of those mountains who look different from you. Ridiculous. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all one creation, one human family. We need to care for each other and care for our mother. And our brother and sister species. And just like on the airplane where they say, first put on your oxygen mask and then help your you know, child or little brother or whatever, right? It's the same with life on earth. Humanity, we need to put on our oxygen mask, our feeding tube, if you will, <laughs> right? Uh, before we can then really get to work on cooling the planet and saving the rest of life on earth. We need to be well, because if we're not well, if we have whole populations of brothers and sisters starving, oh my goodness, that's going to breed violence, it's going to breed war, it's going to breed terrorism, it's going to breed theft, it's going to breed destruction. You can have people going into fields of crops and picking plants that aren't even ready to eat yet and wasting the whole crop because they're starving. We need to get way out in front of this. The time is now, and we are getting ready to launch this network, to launch the website, and to put this message out there, right? To record some videos, we're recording this right now. We could use excerpts from this, if everyone's cool with that. We're just humanity coming together to feed everybody. That's it. Nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, it's something to be proud of. Thank you all for being here. Well, the, al the alternatives are anyway, we either get it together and come together and start feeding each other, you know, looking after each other in that sense. Or there won't be very many of us left by the time they decide and come come to that decision in the end, if you get my drift, you know what I mean? Because, you know, if we don't get it together, a lot's going to go wrong and uh, the population will dwindle a lot before they ever figure out that they're going to have to get together and like it, go back to the way it was. And if we have a whole village and they're depending on the crop, they all... They all dug in and they all got together and they all have to do it like so you know we're just a big a large village no again sorry for the interruption oh come on james quit apologizing brother <laughs> <laughs> i think you're just being polite let's see um <laughs> he'll be very apologetic but then you'll hear some f-bombs drop <laughs> yeah. and this is part of it is is we come from different cultures right we, we come from different worlds. They seem like different worlds. Our world has been getting smaller and smaller. But, you know, one of the beauties of this is, you know, James has put together a whole, is putting together a whole community in Ireland, right? In support of, of, of our work. And it's such a beautiful thing. So now we're just suddenly surrounded by all these wonderful Irish people <laughs> with accents like James. <laughs> Remember, Jamin, the Hopi prophecy. We are the rainbow warriors. That's it. That's it. This is what we're here to do. That's exactly right. That's it. Well, as Shankar said in this text, they are a global family. Like, so definitely global family. That's it. That's it. And what do you do when you're reunited with your global family after such a long time being separate? You have a big feast. You feed everybody. And you say, what's up? How you doing? <laughs> and you tell stories and you share like we're doing right now.
We're building the family we never had that we didn't know was always waiting for us. Welcome home. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Nice to have some more warriors in the house. Glad to be here. We need you. Did any of you uh, catch um, that? Uh, it was on. I think it was MSNBC News the other night. There, uh, um, not the governor of uh, New York State. No, uh, Andrew is Andrew Cuomo, the younger brother. Anyway, um, he was on, and he was uh, saying like that. Uh, you know, he was talking in general. No, he was talking uh, similar to what we were saying ourselves about things are you know, going to be different and the future is going to be different and we're going to have to come up with different ways. And he said a lot of it will have to do with communities as well. So he was saying, you know, we need to find new ways and get together and find new ways, you know. You know, so they're, I think they were having some kind of a talk and he was advertising that and saying that they want to get people together and, you know, put their heads together. So I, I must try and look up that now on YouTube again, that, that news report I saw, like, but, um, you know, they're definitely someone that they could be worth getting in touch with too in the future. You know, they have their heads screwed on in the right place, definitely. The two brothers there, the corners. Good stuff, James. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of leaders who are so ripe and ready for this. Not all of them know it yet. But a lot of people, this is, this is just, it's obvious, right? It's so obvious. The thing is, we got born into, a, into the wrong modality, and we're finally getting on track, getting on the right track. We got to take care of everybody. It's just simple as that. Emery Brother, up in Montreal, Canada, what you got for us? Some been reflecting on the problem that's facing us, trying to get some clearer understanding about what's going on and uh you know the fact that we're discussing that it's getting cold and it's getting hot you know that that brings me to a to a um to something that needs to be expressed is um you know the the rate of change is the problem, is the issue. I mean, there's going to be climate change and abrupt climate change, but the abrupt climate change that's being talked about by, by the authorities, such as Guy McPherson and, you know, colleagues, uh, you know, it's the rate of change the rate of change for the bio biology for life the the supporting vegeta the, the vegetation that supports our lives and the lives of the animals and the the you know the different layers of of species right to the minutest forms okay that's the issue here is that they cannot they cannot keep up with the rate of change. And these extinctions that happen as a result, okay, and, and it's varied. There's a big variation, you know, between what kind of species it is. It's vegetation, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, lives like humanity, animals, you know, it's, it's, all-encompassing because we're all 
affected by each other, okay? And it's a dominoish kind of effect that, that, that's occurring. Now, now they're plowing under, veg, they're plowing under crops that's not, they're not coming in in a timely manner. And that's a result of this, this problem of cold and hot, okay, the, the change. Now, I, I could suggest that, you know, as some uh, were down the line, we, f we try to focus not only on cooling the planet, which we have to do with SRM, right, as you were talking about, but there's other deeper problematic issues with that, you know. I think the, that overall, we need ways to control the climate for the growing of our, our, our food, okay? I mean, we have greenhouse effect, but we need darn greenhouses. We need greenhouses in which food can be grown and controlled so that they don't perish, so that we'll have food to eat and won't die from starvation. And, and that goes to say we have to feed the animals also. I don't know, this is a, this is a tremendous, pro, tremendous issue. And, you know, we need collective intelligence for sure, but the, 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 the solutions are very multi-level very multi-level and um, we can't paint all of them with the same brush that's what I'm saying so um, in the meantime in the meantime I think we're on a good good path with good intention to feed to feed uh, feed the uh, people and uh, it's worthwhile doing, you know, I mean, anything we can do, but we got to keep the, the big picture in mind. You know, this abrupt, this abrupt change, that's, that's the, the critical thing. It's going to make it or break it. We got to be able to control it so that, you know, the growth of our crops can continue. Well, I think you, um, I think you hit the nail on the head there, anyway, Emery, because uh, you're right. Like the the weather phenomenon that we're going to be expecting from all of this, uh, all of this warming, um, it are you know they are going to be more frequent and more violent and. Um, and the reason does different. I can kind of give you an answer to the, the, the heat, and the, the hot, and the cold, and situation, and everything else. That's basically because the upper str uh, stratosphere is all messed up now, and, and the, the, the vortex is messed up. Like so, um, there's low pressures and hot, high pressures all over the place. No, rather than having the proper balance that we normally had. In other words, our climates are already messed up now. Um, so it'll be hard to, to tell what way the weather will be from one week to the next, in other words. like And already the weather forecasters around the world are starting to use expressions like, eh, it's difficult to tell what it'll be like tomorrow now, or uh, we're not really sure about that now, we probably have to, it might go two ways on. And then they're showing, the casually showing the, the you know, the, the vortex, polar vortex as all over the place as if it was a normal thing, you know what I mean? But um, Either way, I'm getting distracted. Point is, you're right, you hit the nail in the head. We are going to have to come up with different ways as well of how to grow our foods to, in, in different, uh, dealing with different weather types and everything else. But that's what the conversation's about because if we don't have these conversations now and all these other things start to go, start coming down the line later on, we're going to be completely in the dark. You know what I mean? At least we're, we're getting the conversation going now, anyway, which is the main thing. And, and all these other items will be tackled as well because there is a big list as you said uh, Emery but we still have to tackle the priorities there has to be the, you know you have to have a, a priority list and we have to tackle first things first and I think Jamin's right with the food plan if everybody food in their bellies they have time to sit back and think and converse that's about the size of it so 
you know, but it is, I get where you're com coming from and I get your concern. We, I think we all share that though. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But, but what, what, what I'm suggesting is that there should be a massive effort made to increase greenhouses and growing facilities which are controllable because I, I doubt if there's enough of them and um, if we can't control the environment um, for at least the food the basic amount of food you know we're going to be in trouble and you know we want to feed uh, everybody as many people as possible so you know this will aid the global dimming of course you know because you're gonna have to have production industry producing what what's needed and it's gonna be a heat engine for sure because we are a heat engine when we produce things but the upside is is that at least we'll have food and food is uh high priority and uh so is water so we got a, those two major main concerns food and water and shelter now for i just want to point something out as a sidebar issue i'm in montreal and look we're we're the 22nd of may right and uh you know the fluctuations in the weather are here I mean, never in my life, you know, look, I, 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 my room is, my, I got a window facing, facing west, and the sun's going down around, uh, you know, around the supper hour over here, and it's freaking hot. I mean, it's the rays are just unbearable, all right? It's just unbearable. I mean, for heaven's sakes. You know, and, and I got the wind, I got the curtains closed, you know, but it's the, it's the, it goes through, it penet it's penetrating, right? And if our life forms have to deal with this kind of heat, all right, because it's not being blocked out, you know, we're getting different kinds of rays that are, are that are coming in, all right? because it's so screwed up, the, the atmosphere. Now, that's part of the problem. Yeah, well, we, we've had one of the hottest um, and driest springs here now in Ireland this year. It's normally raining throughout the months of March, April, and all that, like, but uh, we've had no rain. But uh, for the past two days now, we're in the, in the midst of a, a, a severe storm that's been knocking trees all over the place in my village. So I think it's the tail end of an Atlantic hurricane that was out there last week somewhere on the east coast of America. But um, yeah, it's 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 definitely contrary, contrary weather like uh, compared to the norm. So the climates are definitely messed up. So we definitely have to get our heads around figuring out how to, how to grow food in it. Like, but uh, I, I'm, I'm like even like that. Like as I said, we if you can't get the world uh, anyone to work on a mass plan unless there's a mass amount of people involved in the conversation in the first place. And that's what we're trying to do here. Anyway, is get people involved in the conversation. So our, our, I think what's actually one of our biggest priorities is to get more people work on getting more people into the conversation. You know what I mean? Uh, because this conversation is doing is, is here for all the right reasons is it seems it's as as we was discussing earlier and Jackie was on about how well everybody's bonding and uh, how you know it feels more like family meeting and every week and you know you're engaging with like-minded people it's it, it's a, it's a different experience and it's vastly um nourishing and to me anyway like that so but you have to have people, more people involved in it. Like so, we have to work on getting more people in here. Like that's, that's, that definitely has to become a priority. You know? Thanks. Yeah, totally agree. And I, I feel like we've got a good, 
a good plan for that, a good strategy, which is inviting the feeder communities, right? People who are feeding other people and who are interested in being part of a planetary community of feeder communities. I mean, it's just like, doesn't that just feel like the natural step? Does it feel kind of obvious? It's like, hello, <laughs> right? So um, as we put out the invitation and there are, you know, got to be tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of feeder communities around the world. Just huge numbers. And we say, listen, we're, we're putting together the community of communities of all the feeder communities come together. We're all going to help each other. We're all going to get there together. That's the message. And a big part of the collective intelligence, this gets to what <clears throat> um, Emery and others were discussing earlier <clears throat> about, you know, um, depending on the conditions, we may need greenhouses to, you know, trap the heat in to help grow more, more food, or we may need greenhouses to keep the heat out, right? Whether through partial shading or even air conditioning massive scale air conditioning and massive batteries of greenhouses, whatever it takes, right? Because if it gets too hot and the plants can't survive, that may be our option, right? I mean, these, these greenhouses, they can be built with uh, reflective, reflective material as well. So you're gonna have both ends of the spectrum covered, you know? like blinds you could put up the blinds at some point uh you know i i don't know it's it's fairly complicated you you, you know the, you got these farmers and the and the growers they know exactly precisely when these these uh, crops need to be planted and what time of the year how much sun they need you know it's 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 quite a complex formula you know, that they understand and, um, you know, <laughs> they're going to have to be in charge and in, involved in the conversation so that, you know, they could bring us up to speed. They could bring us up to speed and, and tell us a lot more accurately what they are experiencing so that we can uh, fully understand the, the nature of the beast that we're dealing with. And... Um, focus our intelligence in the proper direction, you know? Yeah, well, on, on that uh, topic, uh, Emery, <clears throat> I think one of the things that we can focus on building, and I think this is something we can state from the get-go, because this is just a vital thing. Um, however, um, however unpredictable, chaotic, changing the climate is, at any given moment in time, we have our best estimate of what it's gonna be based on computer models, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying that the computer models are perfect. I'm just saying at any, at any given moment, we have our best estimate of what we can project in the coming days, weeks, months, et cetera. Based on those projections, however imperfect, uh, and with all the data that we have all around the world of soil types, of rainfall data, of um, sunlight, et cetera, et cetera, cloud cover, whatever else, we can therefore model and predict what would be the best crops to grow in a particular part of the world, right? And so that people in that part of the world can simply go to that part of the collective intelligence and look at the map, zoom in on their location and see what the data is telling them, right? about 
what is predicted temperature wise, rainfall, et cetera, and therefore what crops they should grow. Or these are the top three options. You know, either take your pick or uh, coordinate with the rest of the community. So you kind of divvy it up, right? We'll grow this, you grow that, you grow this, and we all share the food in the end, right? Yeah. Or we uh, have, you know, mm -hmm, yeah, Emery. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, it's not like we don't have plenty of water also. You know, we got plenty of water and we've got technology uh, to, uh, you know, desalinate. Uh, de uh, how do you, what's the, how you pronounce that word? Desalination. Desalination, right? Uh, there's plenty of uh, that technology available. Uh, you know, but forget about the expense. And of course, you've got your, uh, you still have lots of ice still. That's plenty of water. So, you know, it's, you can get the water to the right places. Uh, that would be an accomplishment also. It's like just getting the food to the right places, <laughs> you know, delivering the food to, to people and delivering water to grow the crops because uh, it's uh, all important. You gotta spare no expense at this point of the game. Well, I've always questioned why they can pump oil all over the world, but they can pump gas all over the world. <laughs> why can't they do it with water? You know what I mean? No, in Kenya, they recently um, started using desalinization techniques, and I think that's definitely going to be a big part of the future, is um, desalinating the water for, you know, from the ocean. Um, but at the same time, it's got to be done in balance. Um, we, we still need our oceans, too. We need salinated water as well. So, I mean, it's when we're talking about millions and millions of people, it's definitely a balancing act and um, something that we have to keep in mind and consider. Well, it would be one way of dealing with the rising oceans. If the oceans are going to rise, we might as well drink it <laughs> and use it on the crops. You could think of it as a massive resource allocation exercise. Remember earlier I talked about it as like a massive multiplayer game, right? Where we're optimizing for food production and distribution, right? And um, every piece of arable land is, you know, a potential resource for growing food. What crops do we grow on which parcels? Which parcels do we let rest, right? Etc. But imagine running this as one big global model, right? Which also says, okay, there's going to be a water shortage. There's a predicted water shortage in this area. How do we parcel out this water among these different, you know, fields, right? So, for example, in Mexico, I was living in Western Mexico, late '90s, early 2000s, and the area was experiencing a drought. And so what they were doing was they were allocating the water to the greenhouses that could recycle the water, right? Because the greenhouse captures the humidity. Um, they just use a fraction of the water that open fields do that are just evaporating, 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 right? So that's an example of a re resource allocation. So yes, you have your hand up. Mm -hmm. I've I've only just discovered the hand thing because I didn't I didn't know when I wasn't vis you know when I wasn't visible how to um do the hand anyway I've discovered that now um I've forgotten what I was going to say because <laughs> 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 I'm talking about that um what what did you just say 
Damon? Yeah, I was just talking about it's, it's a massive resource allocation problem, right? We have land, we have water, we have glass, like for greenhouses, we have reflective materials, like for SRM. What do we deploy where? I, I know what I was going to say. Um, there is a case of a sea running dry, uh, there's probably several, but yeah, I suspect you all know about the Aral Sea. So, you know, just pumping, <laughs> pumping out the seas possibly isn't always a good idea. I don't, I don't know how that happens. I, I didn't go into it, but I know there is a sea where all the ships are just there, you know, it's completely dry. I think it's in one of the stands, isn't it? The geographical location, it's in one of the stands, the Owl Sea. Oh, I was saying hello to Sai. Sai has to, is going to be leaving shortly. So I just wanted to thank you, Sai, for, for joining us. And come back anytime. We'll be here for another uh, 11 hours. Sure. Until... sure. <laughs> thank All you. right, Sai. See you soon. Thanks, buddy. Bye. See you soon. Um, yeah, I don't know where that's it's somewhere in like southwestern Asia or something like that. There it was like, um, is that the one you're referring to? So, about yeah, a, it's, yeah. I think it's one of the stands. Um, Kazakhstan or you know one of those stands that's about five stands I think yeah so one of those yeah 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 that's you know between climate change and diverting the flow of rivers and dams and all that kind of stuff we've got all these crazy effects so we need a central model um, that can help us map out a path forward right feed everyone in the meantime during this tra this transition time and prepare to adjust the, the temperature of the planet downward cool the planet and keep it stable that's going to be a massive geoengineering undertaking but it's life or death at this point So, you know, the more we talk about it, um, the more it's clear to me that we need to do this all as one big integrated effort that addresses SRM, cooling the planet, um, collective intelligence, including computer modeling, for weather forecasting, rainfall forecasting, uh, modeling which crops will do well and when the planting should happen and when the harvesting should happen, et cetera, et cetera. So it can be all planned out. Also planned for, you know, massive investments in greenhouse agriculture, where we can control the climate, control, control the variables, right? Um, so it's like we're at the verge of doing this massive planetary scale transformation in our climate and in our food production and distribution. And yet most, the vast majority of the world has no clue that this is coming and that this is urgent, right? So um, I think one of the things that we can, uh, that we can think about um, is, you know, exactly which communities to approach first and with what message. I think we've got the general message, but, um, you know, do we want to target specific feeder communities, right, as we, as we go? Or do we just kind of invite everyone and see who turns up, et cetera? Uh, so you've got your hand up. Go for it. Um, my experience, you know, it's quite a small experience of it, but if people don't want to, a lot of people just really don't want to know about it and they don't want to listen. And any notion of uh, the sixth mass extinction would just 
um, they just completely switch off. I mean, uh, Extinction Rebellion did a good job, you know, getting getting it into the media, getting the media to concentrate on climate um, chaos. But the general public, they they just completely switch off. I, I've had friends, you know, like quite educated friends, and I've spoken to them about it. They just glaze over, utterly glaze over. It's a strange experience. That, that's why I'm here, because I couldn't have the conversation with any one of them. Yeah, so the way I'm envisioning this is um, we just get our messaging really clear. And I think we're basically almost there. We just need to write up and refine that which we've been talking about, um, which is really simple, actually. <laughs> Let's come together and work together and share, right? Um, And so as to how to, 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 to grow then and how to get there, my feeling at this time is get our messaging tight as we can, get it out there, invite, 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 invite. And um, as more and more people join, as our family grows, we will uh, come up with better and better messaging, better and better solutions, better and better strategies. Um, and one of the things that we're aiming towards is doing an international press conference in a particular location, such as New York City, Brooklyn, um, to project the message around the world and I mean, I'm envisioning that at some point there will be like a tipping point where this simply becomes the thing, right? And suddenly everyone's talking about it, right? Oh, you want food security? Tap into the network, right? So far we're calling it food healers per, you know, a couple weeks ago, picking the name. Um, you know, that will be the network or whatever the, what, what, whatever it's ultimately called, I don't care, but there will be a network. And the, idea, the, the meme will be very simple. You want food security for your region? Join the network. Simple as that. And that way, in a sense, the network in many ways can operate almost like a global insurance company, right? that, hey, if a particular region gets hit with drought or flood or whatever and gets their crops wiped out, here you go. We'll ship you the food from whatever areas had surpluses. See, now that animal agriculture is getting wiped out, right? All the corn, soybeans, sorghum, et cetera, that used to get fed to the animals, can now be repurposed to humans, right? So we need to create this network and invite everyone to participate and together co-create all the mechanisms, all the parts that will make the whole system flow. So for example, some big farmer in the Midwest who is just producing, you know, millions of bushels of corn, for example, you know, how do we work together, <laughs> right? If it's in a money system, we buy the, the corn from the farmer. In a non-money system, um, I could imagine the farmer donating all the food and then in return asking that others donate to, to him or her uh, oil, 
spare parts, maintenance services for the tractors, et cetera, et cetera, right? All the, all the inputs. Like, could we just do this as one big gift economy? Right? And how do we get there? Right? How does the farmer get credit for being so nice, for being so generous? Right? Is there, are there some kind of social points, et cetera? So, so many things need to be worked out. Right? So, um, we have this grand vision with three stages, feed everyone, go collective super intelligent, and cool the planet through SRM. We have this grand vision. We're putting together a network. We're meeting twice a week. Everyone's welcome. You know, we're putting out invitations, invitations. Either humanity is going to wake up and join us as a whole, or it's not, right? But we are going to do everything we possibly can to coax our brothers and sisters, the rest of them, to join us. There's no reason everyone cannot be in on this. Every last person. No reason whatsoever. Have you decided whether or not it's going to be Brooklyn still, or are we going to have um, multiple press releases at the same time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the question is really about the, about the press conference. We're talking about this big press conference we'd like to do in Brooklyn, New York, um, announcing all this and also doing food deliveries at, at scale. We've also talked about doing simultaneous press conferences in multiple cities on the same day. Um, and let me tell you exactly where I'm at with, with that, Jackie, me personally, right? But it's really up to all of us to collectively sort this out together. But given that um, really for us to be effective at a press conference anywhere, we need to have a critical mass of feeder communities in that city right, on board, working with us, and really co-creating it with us. And so, for example, let's say we were to do it in Brooklyn, we would need to recruit, I don't know, minimum 100, right, Commu you know, feeder communities in Brooklyn of, of all different kinds, right, food banks, churches, community centers, et cetera, et cetera, local supermarkets, whatever, the whole network, so that we have broad representation across the entire network, share our vision, get their input, do this process, but in probably in multiple Zoom rooms in parallel, right? So we can be covering different topic areas in parallel. Um, And that's just for, just for Brooklyn. But because we really, you know, don't have a lot of inroads into Brooklyn, Fallon sent me a nice email uh, before we started this morning. He let me know he's kind of busy going through some stuff. Um, but he misses us and, you know, wants to engage. But anyway, that's been our one connection into Brooklyn so far. And uh, But imagine we just build out. But our goal is to build out a planetary network. And in fact, that's going to be really the basis for our success. And so I say we build, I say we just get to work on building the planetary network. Yes, say that we have a press conference in mind that we'd like to do, but first we need to build the network out. And that's where the stage that we're at right now. And everyone's welcome to join us. We meet twice a week, Tuesdays and Fridays. And join us and let's do this, <laughs> right? And whoever shows up, shows up. I think uh, for now, for now, I think most of the eggs in the basket are uh, in Brooklyn. So uh, that would be most, uh, most obvious to me as from what I've been uh, experiencing here during all these uh, meetings. 
and just in general, you know, Brooklyn and New York seems to be the apex for media and uh, it would be a wise choice and, uh, you know, get, get our feet wet, you know, get the toes in there and uh, it doesn't have to stop there, right? But at least the, the beginnings of it can, can uh, be developed from Brooklyn. And uh, that seems to be where all the energy, uh, that's where the well is, I think, at the moment. Yeah, it's the, it's the apex of news media. It's also the apex of the pandemic. And it's the closest thing we have to a capital city for the entire planet is New York City. So for those three, and it also has tremendous cultural and ethnic diversity, which is a huge plus, right? Yeah, so I all- like, mm -hmm. I like the connection. Sorry, Jim, and I like the connection to Ireland too. Yeah, that's, that's very powerful. Very, very powerful. Um, so- And that's reaching out to the Brooklyn Borough President. So we also- Yeah, yeah. As well. And, yeah. and I'm a little biased myself because I feel like with this mission, I was speaking to my uncle last night, I was telling him about our idea and he's like, are you crazy? Brooklyn? They're dying by the hundreds still there. And I'm like, then that's where we need to be. That's where we need to be, where the, we need it the most. So to me, it's, it's just as just the whole initiative of feeding everyone is you go when you're needed and you do what you have to do. Yeah, uh, as hard as it seems, because, you know, let's face it, there's, it, it's going to be hard, you know, for a bunch of us, you know, I mean, Jackie's originally from New York, but you now live in Arizona. For, for us, none of us are living in New York now. It's going to be hard. But no matter what, we're in a hard place right now. And we need big problems call for big solutions. New York would be a big solution. The very but fact that, sorry, Jim. The very fact that none of us are uh, from New York, barring Jackie, you no, know, like, uh, but um, living there uh, or from there. But that 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 is very poignant in itself that we're reaching out to try and help, like, and we're all from different play parts of the world in the first place. That's very, very, there's something very special and strong about that in itself, as far as I'm concerned. Like, um, and as Jackie said, if they're, you know. If if that's the the epicenter of New York itself, like uh, Brooklyn, then that's where it's most needed as well. I can't, you know. So, seems like we're in the right place at the right time. Question: uh, The snack bar website, uh, the snack bar. Like, I, I how soon are you go, going to be getting that up and running? Or we were on it for the last week. I don't know if we discussed anything about it today, no, because I was missing. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, so, uh, so Snack Bar, uh, for, for folks who don't know, is the social, well, we were starting it off as, as we, our latest thinking was that it'd be the social network of awesome communities, right? Being communities that are engaged in the conversation. How do we save life on earth? Um, and then we toyed with the idea briefly of, of the feeder communities. That, that that be the place where we, you know, ask them to come. But I thought, of, my feeling is that between the two names, Snack Bar and Food Healers, since it's about feeding people all around the world, which is a very serious subject, um, I think that Food Healers is a more serious name, more fitting to the, to the topic, to the subject and the mission than Snack Bar. Snack Bar might be great for a social network of awesome communities, 
which could be just focused on the broader conversation. How do we save life on earth? Nothing wrong with that. But my feeling right now is um, I'd really, I'd really, I'd personally think it's best that we focus on the feeder communities around the world, just really focus there. Um, these other conversations that are kind of going here, there, and everywhere about, you know, whether it's about collective intelligence or we need to change the politics or we need to do this, we need, you know, anything that's, that's, that's uh, not, anything that does not land right squarely and you know what, we got to feed everyone. I feel like they're missing the plot. I, I kind of feel like they're, they're, they're missing the point. And um, we've, we've been talking about bifurcation in the last couple of weeks. Um, I think this is actually a really powerful way to bifurcate. Those of us who are focused on solving the world's problems, starting with feeding everyone, versus those of us who are focused on solving the world's problems, starting somewhere else. I don't think there is a somewhere else. I think we need to get ourselves together as, the, as a single human species. And once we're together and taking care of each other, oh my goodness, we can go off and do anything. But if we're not together, if we're fighting each other and trying to steal from each other and trying to hoard from each other and trying to this and that and the other, we're gonna continue to be a mess, right? With absolute clowns like Donald Trump saying and doing just ridiculous things because we're just, we're, we're in such a mess right now. We're so fragmented. So this is the beginning of humanity coming together. That's how I see it. I don't know that, I don't know that we necessarily market ourselves that way because that might seem arrogant or something like that. Again, keep the focus on food and feeder communities. It would be my suggestion. But I'm just, look, I'm just putting it out there. I'd, I'd love for someone to say the opposite and then we talk about it. You know, let's just, let's see what makes sense. What do you think? Let's just kick it around. This is the collective mind at work. I, I agree. I think um, feeding people is definitely paramount, you know, making sure that we can eat. And I, I like a lot of the strategies that I'm, that I'm hearing about, you know, um, with the vertical gardens and whatnot. I think one thing that um that has always bothered me is that there's so many trees, like I live in the Northeast, right? I'm in Connecticut and there's trees everywhere, but none of them bear fruit. And I never quite understood that. Like I lived in Ghana and West Africa for a little while and that just wasn't the case. You know, anywhere that you go, you see fruit bearing trees. And I think that needs to be a large part of our initiative when we're talking about feeding the planet is just these, I mean, trees are just, they, they, they're continuously bearing fruit, you know, and if we have, we have all of these trees that aren't bearing fruit, they could easily be replaced by trees that are without much maintenance and they're hardy, you know, and they can withstand, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the various temperatures and fluctuations in temperatures. I, I think that's um, a strong initiative that could take place um, that could involve massive communities, you know, and, and do it in a way that's manageable. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, definitely. Great idea. And, um, you know, in terms of swapping out trees or just planting new trees and leaving the old ones there, um, or, um, Again, it's for, I, I, I see these are very local questions, but which can be supported by a planetary collective intelligence. That's, you know, a big part of the, uh, of the formula we're proposing, right? Um, you know, both in terms of what to grow, how to grow it, but then, you know, what's, you know, that, that's one whole set of solutions. And then the other is kind of like, what's the model, right? How do we, how do we do the sociology, economic, you know, monetary, et cetera, part with or without money, but how do we do it, right? Both of those need to be addressed. And I think if we get the feeder communities together, the answers will just emerge as we bring more and more feeder communities together. They're the experts at this. Let's bring them in, right? Okay, I think Emery had his hand up first, followed by So. Uh, go for it, Emery. 
Yeah, you got to bring those feeder, the feeder communities in. Uh, and when you say feeder communities, I tend to look at it like the growers, the farmers, the ones that are planting the seed into the ground. The, the, those are the absolute feeder, feeder uh, people, you know. And uh, talking about planting trees, you know, we have a society, we have people in charge who are cutting down trees for the, for the monstrous 5G. You know, come on, give me a break. They're, they're cutting down trees in mass. Uh, not planting trees, you know, how stupid. You know, like uh, like Joe uh, says. Uh, I mean, you could just as easily plant a a fruit tree uh, along a boulevard, right? But you know, you got the people that they don't like to pick up the the rotten apples afterwards. It's the cleaning. It's the all kinds of excuses. You know, the economy. Well, they want to get people to pay for this stuff. You know, but it, it would make no 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 difference it would be a great thing people could uh, take a lemon or take a take a peach from the boulevard i mean sure i mean how smart do you have to be to to do something like that you know i mean here in montreal we have uh, trees all over the place especially in in my area you know it's beautiful you got trees along uh, most of the streets big nice trees and people, they plant little little uh, gardens around the tree. The, the tree is in, embedded in the sidewalk, but there's space around the tree. And people plant stuff. It's wonderful. You know, I mean, oh, that could be multiplied by hundreds of thousands of times, you know, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely, and that's 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 precisely the idea with with sharing of these different practices. Alrighty, so go for it, so. Um, I expect you all know that in in China, the fruit crops from the trees they're having to, in a lot of places, they're having to pollinate by hand because of the um, beehive collapse. You know the disease bees. I even saw some kind of robot bee. They even given it stripes like yellow and <laughs> yellow and black stripes. <laughs> I'm sure it could have done the job <laughs> without the colours, but you know, we like we like to be painful. It looks utterly clumsy. I just I've just seen a picture of it. I just can't believe it's it's gonna be refined enough to do the job. But so that is an indication of you know, just food. Food is like something that very soon be something that is our food system could collapse so easily. I think even in the Midwest, they're having big problems, aren't they? Things bolting, crops bolting, lettuce crops bolting because of the weather changes and uh, crops failing. Uh, in Extinction Rebellion, they kept talking about the possibility of multi bread basket failure is if you had two or three of the chief uh, bread baskets in the world failing, failing simultaneously, we're in massive trouble. Yeah, in fact, um, I mean, all the screams for the urgent need for just planetary scale coordination and planning, including the stockpiling of grains right now, you know, to buffer us for if we have a lean year, right? Um, I mean, it's it, it just, it screams for collective intelligence, collective action for humanity to come together and finally become like a bee colony or an ant colony where we're all one integrated whole. But how to do that? 
Well, the end to clear answer is collective intelligence. Yes, so. Yeah, it's, it's collective intelligence, but I do wonder if it will take a, the hungry bellies that, I mean, in some parts of the world, that, that is already happening and has been happening for a long time. But, you know, the power is in the global north and will it, will it literally take hungry bellies for people to budge? You know, we've got a few people who've been, you know, pushing away at all this stuff for donkey years. And, you know, things have happened, and, but so slow and it's an emergency, you know, it would, it would, I think it would literally take hungry bellies for people to realise. It seems to be a terrible lack of imagination. People just cannot imagine their way into this climate thing. A few people can, but and people, farmers who've experienced loss of crops and things, they can. But a lot of people just cannot get their heads around it and it will literally take the hungry bellies. All right. Well, my sister Jackie is uh, indicating that she has a hungry belly and needs to take a dinner break. I wouldn't mind taking a little dinner break myself. Um, and just a heads up to everyone that in an hour and a half, I will I will commence a five hour break. I've been at this. I've been at the helm for thirteen and a half hours, minus tiny little breaks. <laughs> um, but anyway, at nine p.m. starting in. 9 p.m. Pacific times, uh, starting in an hour and a half. Thank you, so. Um, Nolan will cover for me for a period of five hours from 9 p.m. Pacific to 2 a.m. Pacific. I'll get some sleep, and then uh, <laughs> I'll be back at 2 a.m. Pacific time until 6 a.m. Pacific time. When Shankar is often there for the home stretch, but no pressure, Shankar. If you need to get some sleep, you get some sleep, brother, because we need, we need all of us well and healthy. All right. Um, shall we then take a dinner break for what? Jackie, what do you think? I don't even know if Jackie's still there. We'll see. <laughs> um, anyway, shall we break for maybe 45 minutes? Maybe till. Uh... Oh, hey, Will, how you doing? You're on mute, Will. I'm going to unmute you. There. Oh, wait, you're muted, Will. We can't hear you. There you go. I've been, you I've go. been listening in from time to time, and thanks so much. It's very inspiring to see uh, what you guys are doing. Uh, so, yeah, I take a dinner break. I'm, I'm going to be doing a few other things, but I've been in and out the whole day, and uh, it's great stuff you guys are doing. So, you know, just uh, love you guys. Thanks so much for what you're doing. It's love great. you too, Will. Thank you, <laughs> brother. Thank you so All much. Right. So, so great to have you here. Yeah, yeah, our, yeah. Our, lo our local celebrity, Will Tuttle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. We'll 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 uh, we'll be in touch. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Just feel free to pop in and out. This is this is your home, Will. So just make right, yourself at right. home. Thanks. Yeah. It's All right. Great. Okay. Talk to you See later. You Thanks, Will. Yeah. See you soon. Okay, Shankar. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Get some good sleep. Um, all right. Well, why don't the rest of us, uh, whoever wants to, we'll break for, why don't we break till maybe quarter after eight? Um, you know, people come back when you're, when you're, when you've had your dinner. <laughs> so just, you know, it's not like, it's not like everyone has to show up at the same time. That's, the, and that's, that's part of the idea of the block party. The 24 hour block party is, you know, people come and go as they please. We're here for 24 hours. So it makes it easy for everyone to be able, anywhere around the world, 24 hours, so. All righty, Abiyose, yeah, yeah, James. I, I posted a link there, I, well, I put it in the chat there earlier, a, a YouTube link there, I'm not sure if it came up, I couldn't see it on my own phone, but um, it was a YouTube chat uh, link. Oh, yeah, uh, we see it, we see it, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very interesting if anyone wants to look at it there because it's, it's about communities there now and how they got together and to get the water into their fields to irrigate the crops and things. And it was through a community competition that they oh. ran in India. Like, a very interesting short video, like, but uh, interesting to watch. Cheers. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, James. All righty. Well, I'm going to pause recording then.